So uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for giving me uh, the opportunity to give this talk. Um, and uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, send my uh, regards to uh, uh, everybody that is listening and uh, especially my friends from Spain. Uh, I wish I would like to be there, but unfortunately I'm not. And uh, uh, so, yeah, so let's uh, start with the, the talk then. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, share this one. Yep, here we are. I hope you can see everything on here. Okay, so um, today uh, I will start by doing a brief summary of things that um, uh, I have done in the latest um, years in the uh, understanding of aggregation diffusion equations. And uh, then uh, there will be a part which is um, um, much more recent in the uh, direction of uh, understanding the uh, fast diffusion range uh, of these points. Let me uh, start by uh, setting up uh, the questions and some of the uh, uh, open problems and some of the uh, uh, main uh, results that we have done in this direction. So the general topic is about uh, trying to understand uh, the minimization of free energies. Free energies that appear in many applications, in particular one of them is in, uh, in math biology, but I will not enter too much in, uh, in that, just uh, to say that uh, is one of the main sources of some uh, uh, models of this type. And I will uh, uh, refer to them as aggregation diffusion equations. They have uh, essentially they are equations of this form, so uh, we can think about them as uh, continuity equations, where the velocity field uh, has uh, two parts: one part which is uh, non-local and is given by the uh, convolution with a potential that is uh, usually called the interaction potential. I'm going to denote by u, which as I'm assuming is uh, symmetric, and in most of the cases in which I'm going to discuss today is a fully attractive potential. So this is an attractive force. And uh, then uh, there is a second part in the velocity field, which is given by a gradient of a nonlinear uh, non function of the density, which uh, would refer as the uh, pressure function. Uh, and essentially, if you uh, just substitute this velocity field here, you see you get some non-local terms uh, here, and then a kind of nonlinear diffusion due to the gradient of the P of rho. So somehow, uh, the uh, main issue I want to discuss today is in which sense uh, there is a balance between uh, the uh, attraction modeled by the non-local term of that form and the uh, repulsion, which is modeled by the uh, local, uh, in principle, nonlinear diffusion term uh, gradient P of rho. And if uh, this balance happens, what are the conditions on the, the potential U and on the pressure function rho? Okay, so let me start by uh, some uh, basic uh, structural uh, considerations about this problem. Um, the uh, this uh, free energy uh, uh, the free energy associated to uh, that equation uh, that I mean it's a cl the classical free energy associated to that equation has two terms the uh, one uh, due to the non localities uh, is, is a kind of um, uh, a potential total potential energy if you think about it in terms of uh, the physics it is worth about uh, uh, gravitational forces. And the second uh, term here, the blue term, is coming from the nonlinear diffusion, it's a kind of nonlinear entropy term. So that equation I have uh, in this previous slide, it has the uh, formal gradient flow structure in principle, uh, in the sense that uh, if you compute variations of this free energy with respect to uh, uh, perturbations that uh, conserve the mass of the density rho and the positivity of rho, then uh, that equation can be written in this form. So the velocity field is minus the gradient of the uh, variational derivative of f with respect to rho. Where this function phi is related to the function p I have in the previous slide by this relation. Uh, the phi of rho is uh, related to p uh, in, in this way. 
Okay, so at least formally, if uh, you just compute the time derivative of the free energy functional along the solutions of that PD, you can see that you have a dissipation. Uh, I mean, that the uh, free energy is dissipated where the entropy dissipation is given by that formula. Good. So, in principle, you would like to understand uh, 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 qualitative properties about the uh, long time behavior of solutions, of the stationary solutions of this problem. Uh, of course, you would like to have uh, an understanding of uh, global minimizers or if there are local minimizers of this free energy function and want to understand the dynamics. Okay, so then in some, uh, uh, I'm going to understand uh, the um, uh, balance between attraction and repulsion in this model by uh, trying to find under which conditions on u and phi I find uh, local minimizers or global minimizers of the total interaction energy. Okay, this question is a question that is quite classical and uh, probably the most classical uh, example of these kind of uh, questions uh, shows up in uh, crystallization. Although in that case, the U usually is very, very similar. So it's not even locally integral. It's a kind of Leonard Jones potential. And then uh, you are talking about the minimization of this function and not on the set of densities like I'm gonna do here today, but in the set of direct measures. But uh, let me tell you that that's uh, it's one of the classical examples. And then probably the most uh, relevant for me and the most uh, uh, related to uh, these kind of questions is, as I said before, uh, the, uh, the problem in mathematical biology when you try to model chemotaxis. So the chemotactic movement of cells, which are going up the gradient of certain uh, chemo uh, attractant uh, concentration. And uh, the chemotactant concentration is modeled by another diffusion equation that in the case of the quasi-static, uh, uh, in the quasi-static case, when you assume that the time uh, that essentially is, uh, is steady for the uh, uh, for the chemotractant, then you can uh, write it in, in this way by solving the uh, corresponding uh, Newton uh, kind of Newton equation. So typically, they correspond to the case of the Newtonian attractive potential. There are plenty of other applications that I don't want today to enter, but of course, if U is more singular than Newtonian, then this corresponds to a kind of a fractional Laplace, uh, fractional diffusion term that has been studied by many authors, and some of them that are listening to me, like uh, Olmis Vazquez or uh, Matteo Bonfort and others. Uh, then uh, there are some connections with random matrices for particular choices of the potential. Okay. So uh, this uh, slide was just to uh, tell you and make a connection also with a talk by uh, Manuel Del Pino last week when he was discussing about singularities of the Keller-Siegel model, the classical Keller-Siegel model. So uh, this is uh, just a, uh, a slide about uh, the, this classical problem in which typically in the classical Keller-Siegel model here you have linear diffusion and represents in that case the density of cells at position uh, x and time t. And as I was uh, saying in words before, here you have an evolution for the chemoattractant produce density produce by, that in this case is produced by the cells themselves. So there is this nonlinear coupling. I just uh, to give you an idea, if the figure, I hope the movie works, then you can see that the cells direct their movement towards the, the uh, uh, they go up the gradient of the uh, concentration of the uh, corresponding chemical. Okay, good. Just to give you also another visual um, example of how, uh, how the dynamics uh, uh, can, uh, can be, uh, how complicated the dynamics can be in certain cases. Here I'm showing you a numerical simulation with a certain finite volume scheme. I don't want to enter into the details of the scheme now, in which you have a fully attractive potential, but very smooth. So now that uh, it's as uh, smooth as uh, it can be. Uh, just a caution like. And uh, here is the power, it's a power, uh, uh, power low diffusion with exponent three. Yeah, so here is the initial data I'm taking and here is the uh, simulation that you get. And let me just mention uh, in brief, uh, briefly uh, what uh, you can see here in the evolution uh, is uh, one of the typical behaviors that you see in many, uh, I mean, in certain uh, regime that I will discuss later, which is that uh, you typically see the concentration, let me restart it again, the concentration 
at the beginning in certain clusters somehow of the density. And then the, 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 this concentration in three bumps in that case is not really a stationary state, but it's, it stays for a very long time until they start to uh, uh, merge and to interact between each other. And finally, the stationary state is given by uh, a solution which has only one connected component. Okay, so the same thing happens in uh, several dimensions. Uh, just to give you an, a, a simulation now with the uh, potential which is given by the log, like in the classical Keller-Siegel model, this is attractive log, the attractive Newtonian in 2D with the spawn in 3. And uh, here is the initial data that I'm taking. Uh, it's concentrated in three locations. And here is just uh, that uh, I mean, it's a simulation that I like to show sometimes here because uh, the scheme that I use for the simulation here is based on uh, the optimal transportation interpretation of the equation. And then it uses the steepest descent uh, for producing the numerical scheme. So it's computing somehow the steepest descent in a certain uh, distance, which is not uh, the objective of my talk today, which is uh, usually called the Wasserstein distance. And uh, here I'm showing you uh, the geodesic joining uh, the characteristic of a set, which in that case it was the Pac-Man to the characteristic of another set. Okay, so this is somehow the, uh, the technical part that is behind building the steeper descent of the free energy with respect to the geodesics of this distance. And here you have the simulation of that equation. And again, it shows a bit, uh, again, this um, uh, feature that uh, you have first uh, this time scale of concentration in centered clusters, then the cluster interact, and then finally they lead to one single uh, bump stationary solution. Okay, good. So now uh, I would like to uh, then uh, um, study the case uh, of uh, homogeneous uh, uh, density, uh, homogeneous uh, nonlinearities, homogeneous. Um, uh, interaction potential. So let's assume that the interaction potential is a homogeneous function, so modulus of x to the k. k uh, for me in, in this talk is going to be always negative or zero, so it's between minus d and zero, and zero means the log by convention, just to have uh, more general attractive potentials. And uh, let's assume that the nonlinear diffusion is again a power law, rho to the power n. Okay, so just based on the scaling properties of the free energy, since now the, both terms they are homo, uh, homogeneous with different homogeneities, you can easily find by doing uh, scaling arguments, uh, keeping the total mass of the uh, density, uh, different regimes. Uh, one of the regimes that is uh, interesting to us is the case in which the diffusion dominates over the uh, aggregation in the sense that uh, from the point of view of the energy, if you take a given density profile and you scale the profile in such a way that you concentrate it, uh, then you make the energy increasing in the case of the diffusion dominated regime. So then there is the tendency, just based on the energy, that uh, there is no uh, reason for the uh, solutions, because it's a steepest descent of the, uh, of the free energy, to concentrate. So the intuition is that uh, then in that case, you will expect not to have concentrations. So you expect to have uh, global solutions. And that's the, 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 the result that was already proven in the literature, both by Sugiyama and by uh, Calves and myself, and Josebo, which we proved the systems of global solution and then uniformly bounded in time, uh, uh, in particular cases of this whole regime that corresponds to n larger than one minus k over dimension. Then the uh, uh, aggregation dominated regime, which is the complementary case in which n is extremely less than one minus k over dimension, it happens the opposite effect. When you take a profile rho and you scale it, keeping the mass in such a way that you make it more uh, closer to a direct delta, the energy decreases. So it's more favorable to uh, concentrate than to uh, di disperse or diffuse. So then you expect that you may have blow up uh, in finite time for certain initial data, and that's exactly what happens. But also it's more complicated than that. It's not that uh, there is blow up for every initial data, that initial data that in fact, they exist globally and then diffuse. So there is a coexistence of behaviors in that case. And finally, uh, the, what uh, we usually call the fair competition regime. And the fair competition regime 
corresponds to the case in which you have an exact relation between M and K, which M is equals to one minus K over dimension. In that case, then there is a critical parameter and the critical parameter in the way I wrote uh, the equation is uh, uh, I'm writing the uh, critical parameter in terms of chi, not uh, in terms of the total mass, which is uh, probably for some of you in the audience is the uh, classical way. I normalize the, the, the mass in, uh, in most of my talk, just because I like to think about this as a steepest descent of probability measures. So then the critical parameter is chi, and then uh, if chi is less than certain value, then uh, you have global assistance. If chi is larger than a certain value, you uh, can, uh, I mean, you may expect to have low up. And for the critical value, certain interesting things may happen. So this is precisely what uh, the case uh, in which the classical keller siegel model lies in. It, it corresponds to k equals two minus dimension. And then the m is exactly two d minus two divided by d. But in the case of uh, two dimensions, is m is equals one, so which is the case that uh, Manuel was uh, discussing a week ago. Okay, so uh, I want to discuss now briefly on uh, this case and, uh, uh, and just to say what uh, we know uh, briefly uh, about the fair competition regime. Then, depending on the time, I will decide uh, how much time I devote to the uh, diffusion dominated regime. But because uh, today I would like to get into uh, fast diffusion, which is the newest part uh, that we have uh, worked in this direction. Okay, so for the fair competition regime. So here, uh, in the case in which you have this exact relation between M and K that I was referring to, that I'm rewriting now in a different way. Then the main issue, well, I mean, not issue, the main uh, property that you gain because of this relation is that the free energy is homogeneous itself. And uh, it's homogeneous when you do uh, uh, dilations of the density. You take a density, you uh, uh, do a dilation and uh, conserving the mass of rho. And then uh, with the respect to that parameter, the uh, functional is uh, homogeneous. So that's exactly the case of the, uh, as I said, of the keller siegel classical case, when uh, k is equals zero and equals one is exactly, in, uh, that's uh, exactly enters into the family. And then uh, what uh, you can prove in this whole generality, which is, uh, um, I mean, I will mention later on where the, we have uh, published this, um, uh, these results uh, is something that in brief, uh, uh, if uh, I, I make a quick summary, is very similar to the uh, case of the um, classical keller siegel model. So if chi is between zero and chi c, what you can show is that there are no stationary states and that the behavior of the solution of the PDE, of the evolutionary PDE, is that uh, the, the, they, they diffuse and they behave like a, a certain uh, self-similar profile that can be characterized in self-similar variables as the, as the minimizer of another free energy functional in those variables. So very similar to what happens in the case of the keller siegel uh, uh, classical case. When chi is less than chi c, what you can show is that you can find the initial data for which you can show that there is finite time blow up of uh, enough uh, class, uh, 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 classical uh, solutions. And um, if chi is equals chi c, what you can show is that uh, because of the homogeneity and uh, because of the structure of the, of the functional, you can show in fact that there are infinitely many stationary states. In fact, the stationary states are given by a one uh, parameter family of, uh, of solutions that are obtained from a given profile by doing uh, a certain uh, uh, transformation. And uh, how you can get uh, all of that information? You can get that information because there is a very intimately related functional inequality, uh, which gives you the precise value of chi c. In fact, what happens is that uh, you can show that uh, this kind of functional inequality, that for every uh, function L1 and Lm, uh, with the, remember that here we have this relation between M and K, that's very important. Then you have that uh, this kind of uh, risk uh, uh, potential 
uh, of the function f multiplied by f, this kind of double convolution with modulus of x to the k, is bounded in terms of the L1 and the LM norm with that uh, exponents over there. And um, uh, you can uh, characterize the precise constant, the sharp constant of this inequality. And in fact, the C star is intimately related or is given you the precise formula of chi C. And uh, based on the, that inequality and, uh, and knowing the optimizers of this uh, inequality, then you can discuss the full, uh, this full dichotomy of cases, essentially. Let me tell you one thing that is uh, different from the classical keller siegel model. The big difference with respect to the classical keller siegel model is that since you are dealing with nonlinear diffusion, then your solutions are not too smooth. Uh, in fact, they, are, uh, held, they have held regularity, which is related to the M. And then on top, they, uh, they present some uh, free boundary uh, that you have uh, that uh, has that uh, regularity. And uh, typically, if the initial data is commonly supported, solutions are commonly supported for all times. And you have to deal with that difficulty, like in the classical porous median equation. Okay, so uh, if I give you uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, illustration of the different uh, values of M and the regimes that uh, I have discussed before. I have essentially discussed this part of the quadrant because I was discussing mainly when M is larger than one because K was negative between minus D and zero. And I was telling you that uh, we have this uh, uh, in terms of um, K here and M here, we had this uh, red line, which is the one corresponding to the fair competition case. And if, uh, if we are over there, we have this dichotomy that uh, is uh, about uh, systems, global systems or blow up, that uh, is uh, characterized by that uh, function inequality. Uh, then let me see how we are doing in terms of time. Now I want to discuss a little bit about the diffusion dominated case. And then uh, what I want to, um, uh, to uh, go further today and give you some ideas of what the results we have obtained is to go in the direction of K uh, uh, positive, uh, which corresponds to M by uh, uh, the relation one minus K by D. If we follow that red line, it will go into the, fa into the fast diffusion regime. So I want to discuss this part of the quadrant later on. Okay, so let's, uh, let me mention to you the main result that we have done in the case of the diffusion dominated regime. And then I will get back to that. So in the diffusion dominated regime, uh, we knew uh, from the previous results uh, by Sugiyama and Calves and myself that uh, in, uh, for in, 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 in particular for this uh, case that uh, I think is very important and illustrative because uh, it's the case of the Newtonian attraction in two dimensions with nonlinear diffusion. So exactly you want, uh, we can call it the a kind of a regularization of the classical keller siegel model, because we knew from the, those works that as, uh, as soon as M is extremely larger than one, this has global solution. Uh, and in fact, if you conduct any kind of numerics in uh, this problem or related problems in one dimension, you consistently see that uh, solutions eventually converge uh, towards profiles that uh, are radially symmetric decreasing with respect to uh, their center of mass and that they are completely supported with the regularity that comes from uh, the held regularity that comes from the corresponding uh, power n. Okay, what can we prove about what we see on the, some of these uh, simulations in these cases? So the first uh, thing that uh, we did some uh, years ago it was to uh, look first in this particular case to the free energy functional uh, and to uh, show that uh, we had the good candidate for this kind of a steady state. So uh, the global mean mass of this free energy functional. Well, the first thing is that due to Cardinal laws, uh, we know that uh, the Newtonian potential is decreasing by taking decreasing rearrangements. So this means that, uh, in fact, when you minimize this kind of functional, you can already, uh, for a minimizing sequence, you can reduce yourself to a minimizing sequence that is composed of 
a radio in decreasing densities because of that fact, since this doesn't change and this decreases by radially decreasing real range. Once you have that, and uh, the most difficult part is to prove confinement, that uh, uh, meaning that the mass doesn't escape to infinity, and then you can show that in fact there is a unique uh, global minimizer for a given uh, positive mass. We just uh, don't normalize, we just fix the mass for value m, which on top is really decreasing and uh, company supported and with the right regularity like a barren blood solution of the porous medium equation. Okay, and this was done uh, in collaboration with my colleagues, uh, Daniele Castorina and Bruno Bolzone. Okay, we had the good candidate, but uh, the, 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 the thing that we have seen in some of the simulations above and the thing that was uh, consistently seen, uh, uh, obtained in uh, many other simulations is that uh, you do uh, converge in many of these cases to the stationary state that in fact are radially symmetric and readily decreasing with respect to the center of mass. So can, uh, can we uh, show such a result, at least for this regularized version of the Keller serial model? Well, the, the, the difficulty there was in fact uh, to uh, discard the systems of the stationary states which are, uh, 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 whose support is uh, in different connected components. Just because you have a steady state of this equation, uh, you cannot, uh, I mean, the only information that you get is uh, because of the regularity that gives you this, um, uh, this equation. The only information that you get is that the steady states are gonna be under the regularity we are assuming. They're gonna be uh, held their functions or at least continuous. So then you can have infinitely many com connected components in the support a priori. So the difficulty was to uh, show in fact that this cannot happen. Uh, and uh, this would prove that it cannot happen under the following assumptions. So let me, let me try to guide you over the assumptions without entering into the detail here. So uh, what I am assuming on you is that uh, you is always extremely uh, attractive. So that is a, in the sense that it's a radially symmetric uh, function uh, and that is extremely increasing. So this is what it means that it's uh, attractive in, in the choice of sign that I have here. The, I'm assuming that is uh, not more singular than the Newtonian kernel at the origin and that the behavior at infinity is either one of these two. And the objective is just to have that the Newtonian kernel is uh, in any dimension is included under these assumptions. So that's um, essentially it. In fact, this assumption, K2, is not that important. We can now know, we, we know that we can go even for more the, uh, uh, singular uh, at the origin, but it's still, uh, still uh, local interval uh, uh, interactions. Okay, so as I said before, uh, if we have a steady state of the equation, which means that uh, I have, I'm gonna assume that steady state for me is an L1 and infinity, since I know the solutions are uniform in time in an infinity uh, for the uh, time dependent problem. So I assume that steady state is an L1 and infinity uh, with certain regularity on the power, uh, that such that it satisfies this relation in the sense of distributions. So this is what I said before, we can show that then this quantity is, uh, is constant in each connected component, but we don't know how many connected components do we have. The result that we prove is in fact that if you have a stationary solution in that sense of the equation, then it must be really decreasing up to a translation. And this is a result that we obtained uh, in, in collaboration with Sabine Hillmeyer, Bruno Wilson, and Yao Yao recently. I'm not gonna give you too much uh, details on the proof of this, but uh, just uh, uh, to give you two basic ingredients. Essentially, uh, the proof uh, is, uh, uses two ingredients. First, uh, one thing I already mentioned before, that we have a great infrastructure and that there is a free energy functional. And the second ingredient is to use that, uh, being a steady state means that at least uh, uh, um, when you do uh, perturbations around the steady state, the first uh, uh, term in the expansion must vanish, and then the, uh, the second term uh, that appears in the, in the expansion has to be of the second order. And what we show is in fact that we can find a direction uh, in which we decay the energy that contradicts that fact. 
how we construct that direction. So that's the most technical part of my talk today and the uh, way in which you construct that direction that decays the energy and allows you to do a contradiction argument using the data infrastructure is by using a refined version of a stainless symmetrization that is called continuous stainless symmetrization. In, um, in simple words, or you want intuitively, what the, the, this stainless symmetrization does is the following. You just take a, pro, a profile, mu naught, and you're gonna construct, starting from mu naught, a path of functions that they start from mu naught that they are more radially decreasing than before. In which sense? So what you uh, essentially do is that you uh, take this approximation like kind by nibbles of the different heights of the function, and you are like playing like the, the game with the moving uh, rocks, that you're moving these needles towards the center of mass. So if the center of mass of the needle here is this uh, um, red dot, you are moving it to the left to make it more centered towards the, cent the total center of mass. And uh, those ones that are to the right, you move it towards, uh, sorry, to the left, you move it to, towards the right to make it more center, uh, more radially de uh, decreasing. So the interesting thing about this is that uh, you can conserve the LM norm in that way because the distribution function is the same, but also it was proven by Fried and Bock a long time ago that the Newtonian potential decays. What we did is to get a quantitative version of how it decays depending on the potential U, and that is where all our assumptions center in, in such a way that we can show that it decays in a precise way. That is what it allows us to use these together with the gradient flow structure to get a contradiction of uh, assuming that you have a steady state that is not really symmetric. Okay, uh, so uh, let me just mention that this result works under the assumption that we have a steady state independently also the fact that is in uh, fast diffusion or uh, porous medium uh, regime. So it's for any, just assuming that we have a steady state or any M uh, positive. Okay, so if there is a steady state assist, maybe not it assist, then they have to be radially symmetric and radially decreasing. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, let me just uh, then uh, just uh, com uh, go. Uh, I prefer just to go to the last part because I don't have that much time and uh, concentrate on the fast diffusion uh, uh, regime. So again, I'm gonna place myself in some uh, regime in which I'm gonna call diffusion dominated. And again, I asked myself the same question as before I was doing in the case of the nonlinear diffusion uh, porous medium uh, type, uh, what it means that the diffusion wins, uh, in which sense, and uh, how, and, and in which condition again, do we have this kind of global minimizers of the energy? The interesting thing of that regime, when I go for m less than one, is that everything flips around. What do I mean by flips around? So remember that if uh, I go back, if I can do that easily to the fair competition regime, remember in the fair competition regime, there was this uh, hardly little Sobolev inequality uh, that was playing a big role in order to determine the precise constant and the dichotomy between uh, the behavior of solutions. And this was giving you somehow a bound of this uh, uh, double convolution with the uh, risk potential in terms of L1 and L0. For the fast diffusion regime, what we can show in fact is that there is a family of inequalities that we call uh, reverse HLS inequalities. And the, this family of inequalities are uh, new set in one particular uh, range that I will explain in the next slide. And uh, we call them reverse HLS inequalities because in this regime now, what we can do is to estimate the interval of rho to the m. This is no longer a norm because now m is between zero and one. But we can estimate the interval of rho to the m to certain power multiplied by the mass of the density to a certain power in terms of this double interval. And remember that now k k is gonna be a positive quantity, okay? That's the, the big difference with respect to what I was doing before, okay? So uh, in fact, we can prove this kind of inequality totally independent of the, uh, of, of, the, of the problem. 
and uh, we can show that uh, this inequality holds for any uh, I'm gonna uh, use a bit the notation. I'm gonna say that the rho is in LM, uh, even if M is between zero and one, to denote that the fact that I'm assuming that the integral rho M is finite. Okay, so, uh, and then the, this inequality holds if and only if I have this relation between M and K. And it's a relation that is different from the one I had before. And in fact, um, um, uh, we can show that uh, uh, the optimizer uh, of these inequalities in L1 and M, but under a more restrictive condition. I will explain you in a sec at this point. The interesting thing, uh, the interesting features here in the re in regime uh, K uh, positive or M uh, with M uh, less than one, between zero and one, <coughs> are the following. Okay, just to uh, take the picture, uh, to, to connect the picture with the picture that I had before, this uh, straight line here is the one that uh, is the uh, extension of the line that was the, the line uh, giving you the dichotomy between the, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the borderline between diffusion dominated and aggregation dominated, okay? And here is where the dichotomy existed when M is larger than one. But now the things are different, in fact, when we are below m less than one, now we have this curve, which is m equals b over d plus k, which is in fact tangent in zero, and here at m equals one, uh, k equals zero at that point, which this corresponds to the classical keller sigel model at this point. So here it deviates, it gives you this, uh, this curve, and that's the curve that gives you the relation between having minimizers of the energy when you are above that curve, and below that curve in the region one, in fact, the free energy is not bounded below like it was happening before. So in fact, uh, the line uh, M equals one minus K over D is not the good line making the difference between diffusion dominated and radiation dominated when M is less than one. Is this curve now, which is M equals D over D plus K. What happens in zone two? In zone two is where we show that our uh, reverse HLS inequality holds. So meaning then that uh, the minimizer, uh, I mean, that uh, then uh, the, the free energy uh, functional is bounded below. And what we have in the dark gray zone is where we know that the minimizer is attained in L1 LM. But in fact, in the whole region two, what we can show is that the minimizer is an L1 LM density plus possibly a concentration as a Dirac delta with certain mass at the origin. And we can only uh, get rid of, of this Dirac delta at the origin in the dark gray zone. We, in this part, in the white part over here, we don't know if this uh, Dirac delta has re is really there, it has a positive mass, or we can get rid of it. Um, so uh, that these uh, results are part of this uh, of the very recent paper too that appeared last year in uh, collaboration with Matias Delgadino, which uh, was a postdoc of mine at Imperial College, and now is also joining us in Oxford very soon as our postdoc. And uh, Jan Dulvo, Martin Frank, and uh, my previous PhD student, Franka Hoffman. The, uh, just to finish the discussion of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, case, uh, this curve over here, this uh, red curve over here, uh, which corresponds to m equals 2d over 2d plus k, is the only uh, curve in which this kind of reverse HLS inequalities were already proven. They were proven by Do and Joe and uh, Engo and Julian uh, years ago, and just on that line. What uh, we, uh, as I said, what we have done is that the reverse HLS inequality, they are true in the whole region too. By the way, uh, I didn't mention anything on zone three because uh, there is quite uh, easy to show that in fact the minimizer is always a 10 and this corresponds again for K positive but M larger than one. And that case is very easy. So in fact, the interesting things happens here only on the fast diffusion uh, side. 
So this is just about uh, what we know uh, on the uh, minimizers of the uh, free energy. We don't know essentially, well, we know very little, almost uh, yeah, very, very, very little about the evolution problem. We don't know what happens with the evolution problem, and uh, there are plenty, plenty of open problems in this direction, which I think they are very interesting, especially uh, related to uh, the, possibly, uh, the possible concentration or not that uh, may happen at the origin. Uh, so just to be more precise on what I said before, so uh, just to, uh, and to write it in terms of the free energy, uh, the free energy is bounded from below on the set of probability measures. If and only if we are in the zone two, m less than one. And if, uh, moreover, we can say that uh, there exists a global minimizer, that it has to be of that form, but the mass of the possibly uh, Dirac at zero can be zero. We don't know a full characterization of where it can be zero or not, but it's zero in uh, the dark gray zone that I was uh, showing you before. That is the, the region determined by all these conditions here. Okay, so the concentration, does it really happen? We don't have a full answer to that. And that's uh, one of the uh, challenging open problems that we, we see in this direction, which I find, uh, uh, yeah, quite interesting. Okay, so I think I'm almost done. Uh, I just want to make uh, a summary of uh, the global picture I show you in this direction. So uh, the different regions have been identified at least for aggregation diffusion equation with homogeneous pressures and kernels. If you are in, this, in the porous medium case, uh, fair competition regime, you have this dichotomy. And uh, for diffusion-dominated regimes in general, not even both for the fast diffusion or the porous medium cases, you have this uh, result about the symmetry of the uh, stationary states. And uh, in the fast diffusion case, what uh, we have identified is this, uh, again, these uh, different regimes of uh, diffusion-dominated and aggregation-dominated, which is different from the case of the uh, porous medium, and is related now to reverse HLS inequalities. And uh, there, we know very little about everything that is not above the critical curve. In the critical curve, we know also very little and uh, the, uh, the most interesting or striking phenomena is this concentration that, uh, the, uh, that may happen at uh, zero. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. These are the uh, papers in which I based my presentation. <laughs>